W5. I didn't see him. He never came home. A team building weekend takes a tragic turn. He just kept saying Ben's gone. He, he died. I am not surprised this happened. It was only a matter of time. These are just boys, and this isn't a culture that should have been allowed to thrive. And this is like part of my life. Maybe not a part, maybe all my life. The love of the game shines through the fog of war. They come back and continue the play because it's the only way how they can to survive. For us, the hockey is the biggest part in our lives. Hockey is not going to die, and we're still alive. Here is Avery Haynes. Welcome to W5. They dropped their healthy teenage son off at a supervised hockey camp and never saw him again alive. And now his grieving parents are haunted by the mystery surrounding his death. Rick Westhead investigates just what happened at that camp and reveals a hockey culture that is protected by a code of silence. It was an end of summer ritual. For hockey players, a preseason retreat. Acres of fresh air in the Oak Ridge's moraine of southwestern Ontario. A weekend of bonding for the boys on the Oakville Rangers midget double A team. Ben Teague was 17 years old. It was his second year attending the camp. He played with the Rangers the previous season. It was a team building, bonding, hockey camp with the coaches only and the kids, the, the team, the teammates. They did like a tug of war. He told me they had a climbing wall there. He told me that they had had a food challenge where he had to eat something disgusting. Anyways, just stuff like that and just having some fun with the guys. Ben's parents didn't think twice about him going again. They told us about the cabin situation. There was a couple of rooms for the kids and that there was a room for the coaches and they would all be staying in the same cabin. Images from September 13th, 2019, paint a picture every parent would love to see. But cell phone pictures and videos taken hours later show the boys having a party in the cabin with alcohol. For parents Greg and Susan Teague, the hours that followed are still a blur, a nightmare. It was about 5.30 in the morning. Uh, Susie woke me up because she'd gone down to answer the phone. Rangers head coach Mark Morrow was calling about Ben. And I said, what happened? And Mark said to me he didn't know what happened. I asked to speak to Ben, and Ben told me right away that he had been drinking. We didn't learn until months and months later that Ben couldn't walk on his own at that point. Like it was more of a, you know, a critical medical situation that they were in. Ambulance, what is your emergency? Minutes later, at 5.47 a.m., an emergency call was made from the camp. A 911 dispatcher speaks with one of the Rangers' coaches. Are they breathing Hi. normally? No. Can you describe no. his breathing for me? Ben, how are you breathing, buddy? Like, is he gasping for breath, short of shortness, breath? Shortness, shortness of breath. Okay, can you tell me what happened? Does he have, does he have allergies? Um, not that he knows of, but um, they had drinks, alcohol drinks, and uh, he doesn't know. He's never felt like this before. The ambulance arrived at the camp and transported Ben to the Brampton Civic Hospital. Head coach Mark Morrow went with him and stayed on the phone with the Teagues while they also started driving. So on the way to the hospital, I can hear the beeping. And I can hear the beep, and um, I can hear, obviously, Susie and Mark are, are, are talking back and forth. We probably arrived about two minutes behind the ambulance. And I was met in the hall by a, a nurse, somebody in scrubs, and they said, are you the boy's mom? We're stopped by a nurse who asks us if we've seen a counselor or we have a social worker. And um, when I, as soon as I heard that, I was like, this is not, like, that's not something you ask if things are going to work out. And then the doctor came in and told us that Ben had passed. And it was just like, 
I said, uh, no, I said, please keep trying, because I said, he's such a good boy, please keep trying. And uh, he said, I'm sorry that he couldn't do anything because he'd been down for an hour. You don't expect that, right? It's not something that, uh, you know, your kid goes away to a, a camp with their coaches and a, and a hockey team and then there's drinking and then he's dead. It's like, what, like, what happened? Ben was the youngest of Greg and Susan's four children. He played baseball and football and spent time at the cottage enjoying water sports. But hockey was his first love. He showed up at our bedroom door, woke us up for one of those 6 o'clock a.m. practices, it was probably like 5.30 in the morning. He was already in his gear and he was ready to go. And it was just like, what? Like, this has never happened with any of the other kids. Like many Canadian kids, Ben played house league in those early years. And then earned his way onto an Oakville Rangers rep team at the age of 11. Benny was that first one of mine that was, he was out front and wanted to be up, up uh, on the forward line and carry that puck and he was very driven that way. He dropped back and became a defenseman and that's where he ended up in his last uh, four or five years in well, well in rep. He wore number four for Bobby Orr. As a young guy, he would say that Bobby Orr was the greatest hockey, uh, hockey player ever and all the other kids in the dressing room were like, like who's Bobby Orr? He was rushing and trying to get those goals because he liked that. Ben had just started grade 12. He was thinking about university and loved math and engineering. He even had his own small engine repair business. He definitely had a mechanical, an engineering type mind for sure. The siblings were close. Stop. Ben, with his sister Megan, and brothers Matthew and Jordan, all together at Jordan's wedding in 2016. What do you remember about how you told your other children about what had happened to Ben? Greg phoned both of our sons from the hospital. And then he had called a friend of his, and he took him to Toronto, because our daughter was at Ryerson. And, um, he, um, he didn't want to tell her over the phone. We had to be with our kids. We had to be together. That's the only thing, you know, it was just a matter of getting us together. In the wake of so much grief, Ben's parents are still searching for answers. I think that there's no one on this planet doesn't know that you, if you drink a huge amount of alcohol, there could be adverse consequences. I feel they, they must have felt some, um, they must have felt that it was okay that with the coaches that they drink. They must have, or else they wouldn't have done it. Like, why is this acceptable culture? Like, why are they, why are they letting that go on? It's unknown how much Ben drank that night. He died of acute myocardial injury with necrosis associated with recent alcohol consumption. What caused Ben's heart to fail is unknown. A toxicology report said Ben's blood alcohol level was negligible, 0 0.012. There is one other mystery. An additional toxicology report found GHB. While this chemical can be produced naturally, when used as a recreational drug, GHB can provide temporary euphoria or hallucinations. Often called G or liquid ecstasy, the drug is tasteless, odorless, and colorless and when mixed with alcohol, can be lethal in even tiny doses. Ben was a healthy kid. He went away that evening. I saw him just before he went. I'd spent time with him, obviously. He was, you know, playing football. He was uh, playing hockey. He was, I was with him all summer on summer vacation. And then my boy dies. Coming up. He had stripped off all his clothes and run through the maze naked. A glimpse into the dark side of hockey culture. What the hell's going on at this camp? When W5 continues.
More than 100,000 kids play minor hockey in Ontario. From the age of six, Ben Teague loved the game and wore red, blue, and white with the Oakville Rangers. At the age of 17, he had a spot as a defenseman on the midget AA team. On September 13, 2019, he drove three teammates north to a preseason retreat at the YMCA Cedar Glen Outdoor Center. I said, tell Ben, I'll see him on Sunday because I'll be here Sunday night. I'm like, I was all excited. I'm going to see him Sunday. Perfect. But I didn't see him. He never came home. Ben died at that camp. His parents, Greg and Susan Teague, want to know why. I'm trying to find the truth. I'm trying to find out what happened to my son. You take a group of six, 15, 16, 17 year olds, you take them away. If you just let them, like if you just let them go, you know that a group of kids are gonna get carried away and do some stupid stuff. But that's why the coaches are there. That's why it's an organized event at a camp. With few answers from the York Regional Police who began an investigation in September 2019, Susan started gathering her own information, talking to teammates and their parents. Tell me what happened when you reached out to other players on that team, asking to speak with them and with their kids. There wasn't one conversation that we had with those kids that we didn't learn something new. Most of them that came to the house were very candid about the drinking, that they planned the party, that they'd all chipped in. She started building a detailed timeline. Between 9.30 p.m. and midnight, the boys had a party which involved drinking and vaping, chewing tobacco, and dab pens, which are handheld electronic vaporizers for marijuana. They sat in the same cabin as the coaches, and they drank. And the coaches, those young coaches, came in. They themselves told us they came in several times. Um, the boys said they didn't hide anything. The coaches said they didn't see anything. One of those coaches, Ted Blacker, had gone home, and head coach Mark Morrow was in a cabin next door. He had 14 boys that were directly under his supervision, and he has not told us that he went and visited them once, and none of the boys said they ever saw Mark. Nobody told us that Mark went and, and, and even checked in on those boys under his care. He left it completely to a 20 and a 26-year-old. Ian Blacker was a junior coach with the team, and Alex Susi was its trainer. They stayed in the same cabin as the players in a separate room. According to the information Susan collected, the coaches told the boys to go to bed at midnight. No, not yet, not yet. Not yet. Not yet. In this video obtained from one of Ben's teammates, it shows them, minutes later, going to a wooden maze 300 meters away. We'll give you a hint. The end of the maze is in the opposite corner. Susan learned this maze was part of a hazing, or initiation ritual, in which senior players on the team would chase the rookies who were naked in a game of manhunt, and that Ben had won the year before. Benjamin had been made Rookie of the Year because he had stripped off all his clothes and run through the maze naked. After they left, we both sat there and just were like, it just didn't sound like Ben, not something Ben would do. We could never imagine him just on his own thinking he's gonna, you know, streak. One, it's weird, like the whole thing, it's like what the hell's going on at this camp? Again, at this stage, I'm numbed from the fact that my son is gone and I'm starving for information and trying to find out what happened. The hours between one and 5 a.m. were critical. According to teammates, Ben returned from the maze with sore legs. Around 3 a.m., he was vomiting on the cabin porch, then was unable to sleep. Coaches told the kids to go to bed. At 5 a.m., Ben went to the coaches for help. The head coach called the Teagues at 5.30 a.m., and 17 minutes later, a 911 call was made. Okay, the address is, is it 11? Schoenberg, we're at the YMCA camp. 11 Schoenberg? Yeah, they're 11 Schoenberg. There was confusion over the camp address. I start looking on Google Maps. Okay, where are the closest hospitals? Like, where's the camp? Where's the closest? So we're in a holding pattern home, and it was at 6. So we're talking 5.30, and now all the way to 
We're like ready to go. Still waiting. Still waiting. It's a code for King Township 13300 Concession 11. It's in front of the Cedar Glen YMCA. 17 year old male. Second unit, please. Unit fire, police, or second unit pushing the VSA. Code 4 VSA, attending for a 17 year old male who's now VSA. Hey, Brampton, 306 coming in CTAS 1 with a 17 year old male patient. Patient with a witness VSA. Uh, we have currently done nine shocks given Epi, Amio, Lidocaine, Sodium Bicarb. Greg and Susan learned after obtaining the EMS report that Ben suffered two seizures and received nine shocks, 11 doses of epinephrine, and two doses of amiodarone. His vital signs were absent even before leaving the camp. Ken Wilden's son was at the camp for the first time. He called his dad that morning when the boys learned Ben had died. It was, uh, it was a tough phone call. You know, he was clearly in distress, and we were trying to get him to calm down, and, and he just said, you know, like, Ben's gone, uh, something's happened, and, and um, you need to come up and get me. And, we, you know, it was horrible to hear sort of that... Uh, brokenness and uh, you know we literally just got in the car and, and headed up to uh, the camp as fast as we could and so can you describe what you saw and heard when you arrived at the camp we were immediately sort of scanning the parking lot and trying to find out where he was there were kids off on their own uh, clearly upset as we got out of the car. Um, people were crying. Um, people looked sort of bewildered. It seemed like there was a lot of shock. At first, we just gave him a hug and just sort of held on to him, right? He just kept saying, Ben's gone. He, he died. Like, we, they told us he died. And we are just like, like, how? Like, what? Like... Eight days later, in the aftershock of Ben's death, coaches called players and their parents to gather at an Oakville arena. Susan and Greg Teague did not attend. Chairs were all set up in a circle, and I think for us, we were looking like, well, maybe we're gonna get some answers. Tell me about that meeting. The coaches sort of walked through a timeline with us. They talked about this possibility that this was a pulmonary embolism, some sort of blood clot that went to the lung and, and that it was, you know, nobody's fault. And so I think leaving there, we felt a little bit of like, okay, well, we have what we think is an answer or, or reasonable reason why he passed away. Are they getting information that we don't have yet? Because I, I don't have that information from the coroner. I don't have that information from the police. Why are the coaches broadcasting information that like, and where are they getting it from? I believe um, from the kids that they told them that morning that Ben had died of a pulmonary embolism, which is false information. Um, we know from the autopsy he did not. Um, but they also indicated that Ben had a drinking issue of some sort and had, had died of liver failure. Ben's cause of death was undetermined. The Teagues are still looking for answers, and the coroner's investigation is still being finalized. Looking back, how do you feel about the coaches suggesting a cause of death days after Ben Teague died? Well, why were we being told that? I, I didn't understand why that, that story or that scenario was put forward to us. That sort of caused a red flag for me that, okay, if, if that's not what happened to Ben, or if they find out that that's not what happened, surely there's going to be an investigation. There has to be. You have to figure out what happened to Ben. The York Regional Police began an investigation the morning Ben died. As a parent, like, I, I don't know what investigation was done. Nobody, nobody came and spoke to us. Um, 
there was, uh, fr from the organization, there was nobody that approached us or asked us what, what happened. The only investigation, I think we got a call from the police at one point, briefly. My son gave a statement, um, and we didn't hear anything else. Did the police, when they asked for a statement, ever ask to look at his phone for the photos that might be on it? Not that I'm aware of, no. No. Police also never asked for Ben's phone. According to parents we spoke to, police never asked for any of the boys' phones. I know they haven't got Ben's phone. I've offered Ben's phone. I want them to take Ben's phone. I did not want to crack that phone or do anything to it to interfere with, because I thought that it's going to have something on there that's, you know, that I don't want to be part of messing that up. And I've offered it to them, but they haven't, they don't want it. And I don't understand that. Why do you think that's the case? Oh boy. Um, well, my opinion, the police ran with the story that they were first told by the first person that they spoke to who communicated a certain um, course of events. The Teagues allege that the first person police spoke with was one of Ben's coaches. Ted Blacker, who returned to the camp amid the chaos early Saturday morning. He's also a retired detective sergeant with the Toronto Police Service. There's about 25 other people I'm gonna to talk to first before I talk to that guy, because he wasn't there. I'm gonna to talk to all the kids, I'm gonna to talk to the other coaches that were there, I'm gonna to talk to the camp counselors, and then maybe I'll get around to talking to the guy that wasn't there that night. Greg understands the process. He's been a police officer for more than 30 years. And as a trainer on some of Ben's earlier teams, he knows hockey. The police just took this as these are a bunch of hockey kids. Oh, they're good guys. The coaches are, you know, they did everything they could. Five months after Ben died, the Teagues filed a formal code of conduct complaint with the Ontario Hockey Federation and the Ontario Minor Hockey Association. They cited neglect from the Oakville Rangers head coach Mark Morrow and assistant coach Ted Blacker. Their complaint was assigned to an insurance adjuster hired by the association. It became obvious that he worked for Hockey Canada, and that was his job. So do you feel like he was searching for the truth or that he was potentially limiting, trying to limit liability for the organizations? I'm sure it's the latter. The Teagues have never been provided with any details of that investigation and have no idea what the insurance company concluded. They've been given the runaround pretty much by everybody in this case. Kevin Souch is a Waterloo, Ontario lawyer who first met the Teagues in 2021. It's difficult to explain how many errors have taken place in the handling of this case. Um, the, the police investigation was not thorough, um, was not complete. The medical investigation yielded little results. At the most crucial stages of this case, you know, the morning after this event occurred, um, valuable evidence was lost. Valuable evidence could have been gleaned from the players that were there, um, and none of this was done. Nobody really seemed to take the lead in, in trying to, to solve this. The police just were so biased when they investigated this that it was hockey. They were kids like them that played hockey. They were coaches like them. And my boy died at this camp. What the hell went on there? Coming up. This shouldn't happen to any parent. Breaking through the culture of silence. Their children will often end up paying the price. They speak out. When W5 continues. Ben Teague spent hours on the ice every week, learning the game of hockey with the Oakville Rangers. In 2019, while attending a team building camp with his coaches, Ben died at the age of 17. This shouldn't happen to any parent. This is the worst thing. It's like beyond the worst thing that could happen. But I mean, you have to think that these are just, these are just boys. And, and this isn't a culture that should have been allowed to thrive. Ben's parents later learned 
there was a party at the camp with drinking and drugs, and a maze where in the previous year, rookies were chased by the seniors, naked, in a game of manhunt. You just don't go away and say, you know what we should do, get naked, go through a maze, or you know what, this is what we do where we bring alcohol. These are systems that have been set up in place where these things have happened the previous year and kids tell the next kid. Justin Davis knows all about hockey rituals. Good job. Three! He played junior hockey from the age of 15 to 21 and was drafted to the NHL at 18. He's made a career out of teaching and coaching high school kids. Go, right, 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 right. Down the near wing, cross ice pass, shot, scores! Justin Davis! In 1999, Justin helped the Ottawa 67s win the Memorial Cup, the top prize in the Canadian Hockey League. Four years before that, when he was 17 and playing with the Kingston Frontenacs, Davis experienced the hot box and is now finally talking about it. The hot box is, was always a tradition that the rookies would all have to take their clothes off. You'd one by one walk to the back of the bus. We were told when our name was called that you get undressed, you're given a skate lace that you tie around your genitals and then you walk to the back of the bus. On your way to the back of the bus, every veteran would pull on the skate lace. So we got to the back of the bus, you'd have to tell a joke. If you told the joke and nobody laughed, then you had to get in the hot box. Five or six rookies who are all naked, who are all forced to get in this bathroom the size of a telephone booth at the same time. Right, and the heat's turned on full blast, so it's tough to breathe. Justin also remembers the drinking at rookie parties and is speaking up to break a cycle in hockey culture. And they rented a couple rooms and, uh, and there was just alcohol, no supervision, and the leaders on the team were supposed to take care of things, and one by one, guys would disappear from the room and you wonder what's happening, and they would call your name and you'd, you'd strip down and you'd wait, and then they'd call you into another room and they'd say, you need to do a couple push-ups and uh, with your genitals in, a, in a, a cup of beer, and then you'd, then you'd leave the room. But then you started to realize that when you got into the room, you drank a beer before you started the process, and then when you start to process, what the cycle was. The reason things happened to me was because of the coaches that were involved that happened to them generations before. Justin's experiences weren't unique. In 2020, a group of former CHL players started a class action lawsuit alleging years of sexualized hazing and initiations and systemic abuse. We know that the Canadian Hockey League has said that it has zero tolerance on hazing now. In major junior hockey, and in the leagues below it, do you think that hazing has been completely eliminated? I don't think it's been completely eliminated. I think the CHL is doing their best because they realize how badly they failed generations before them. It's the lower levels of hockey that you really worry about. This is still going on. It's just a matter of people are getting caught or they're reporting it. How can it still be going on? Why would players believe they can get away with this without being caught? I think there's an aura around it. I think people talk and they tell stories about they heard this happen and this is how you do things and this is what it takes to be a hockey player. From a culture standpoint, you just learn these things and it's this normalized behavior. Like Susan Teague, Paulette Forbes had sons playing rep hockey for the Oakville Rangers. How did you feel when you heard what happened? Horrible. It was devastating. So why talk about this? I am not surprised this happened. It was only a matter of time, considering the risky behavior some of these coaches. In October 2016, an Oakville Rangers coach verbally abused a player in an outburst in a parking lot after a game. In 2017, Paulette learned that that same coach would be on the bench with her son, and she pulled him and his brother from Oakville and they relocated to her hometown in Nova Scotia. We were going to the rink wondering what's going to happen today. It wasn't easy. Our boys were 13 and 15 at the time. This was the only home, the only life they knew. Two years before Ben's death, Paulette's son was also invited to a team building camp 
with the Rangers. Why didn't you let your son go to a team building event in 2017? We had heard rumors of kids, alcohol, partying at these events, and we had little faith, a little trust in the coaches, and we decided to not let him attend. W5 contacted every parent on Ben Teague's roster, and only one agreed to speak on camera. W5 also contacted parents from the years prior, and while many allegations were made, only Paulette was willing to speak publicly. You've had a family that's grown up in hockey rinks. Why are people so afraid? People don't want to cause any any kind of friction, especially with coaches or um, board members or their children will often end up paying the price. They don't want their child to get cut from the team the next year if they speak out. And that will be what happens. We were right here. It's taken Greg and Susan Teague more than three years to visit a hockey rink again. Healthy boy goes away, there's a party, teenagers letting loose, doing what they want to do, and my boy dies, come on. In 2022, Greg and Susan Teague filed a civil lawsuit naming the coaches of Ben's team as defendants. They claim that had the coaches properly monitored the players and prevented them from consuming alcohol, that Ben would not have died. Why didn't they know? Why didn't they know? Because it was their responsibility to, to take care of those boys. They were minors, all of them, and uh, they were directly under their care. Uh, I need someone to say, you know, we shouldn't let that happen. We we're really sorry that happened. Um, and I just didn't receive it, so. W5 contacted four coaches on the team. One didn't respond. Mark Morrow and Alex Susi provided this statement. The coaches had no knowledge of any activities in which our players were involved after curfew. At all times, the club and coaches required compliance with all team policies and codes of conduct. W5 also contacted the Oakville Rangers Hockey Club regarding their policies pertaining to the use of alcohol by players, coaches, and staff. And in their response, they said, ORHC upholds a zero tolerance policy for drugs and alcohol at any association events or activities, regardless of location for its members and any individuals attending or participating. Coaches and team officials have the same code of conduct. Only days after Ben's death, the coaches returned to the bench. Two months later, the team went on a trip to California. And in 2023, the head coach of Ben's team, Mark Morrow, is still behind the bench, coaching a new team of players. We asked the Oakville Rangers about those decisions and the team said, we are unaware of any finding of wrongdoing or fault on the part of the involved coaches or the organization. The club concluded that it had no basis upon which to ask the coaches to step down. Three years has gone by and these coaches are still coaching. Like this, this went on and there's been no one's answer to this. No responsibility has been taken. There's been no apology. There's been no change of, of how they do things. There's been, there's been nothing. Um, and I, I just don't understand, like somebody died here. What could the York police do now? If they wanted to make this right, if they want to try to address the shortcomings in their investigation, what could they do? I have no confidence in the York Regional Police with respect to this investigation. The way this has gone, the way we've been treated, yeah, um, it's, it's uh, I, I, I don't know what to do, but I think a different police department should be investigating this from the beginning. W5 contacted York Regional Police, requesting an interview with Detective Sergeant John Lowry, who has been in charge of the file since 2020. York Regional Police declined and provided this response. While the case remains open, our investigators have not found any evidence to suggest foul play or any criminality in this incident.
I miss him every day, obviously. Um, yeah, I just miss his presence and him being around and doing things with him and spending a life what could have been. The Teagues have now filed a formal complaint with the Office of the Independent Police Review Director. They want York Regional Police removed from their son's sudden death investigation and a new police service appointed to the probe.